Good morning, everyone. Um, before I even introduce myself, I want to introduce some housekeeping measures uh, to get us started. We are recording this session. So please, if you will, um, mute your microphones and close video transmission to free up our bandwidth. We want this uh, show to go on without too many hiccups. Um, feel free to write any questions in the chat box and we will address them in the order they are received and as time allows after our uh, dialogue today with Mr. Nadal. So today's recorded installment will be accessible via the SAA YouTube channel and its IAAS Archival Vistas playlist. And with that, I will introduce myself. I'm Karen Trivett. I am professor and head of special collections and college archives at the Fashion Institute of Technology, one of 64 campuses of the State University of New York. Now, as your host today, I am here as a steering committee member for the International Archival Affairs section of the Society of American Archivists. Archival Vista's briefings virtual program series technically begins right now. So thank you for celebrating with us. Uh, for today and for two future installments, we will discuss a topic or theme of international focus. The theme will vary year to year, and the theme for this year is archives in peril or at risk. Our vantage point will begin with a bird's eye and macro view, while the remaining two programs will drill down to a greater detail and present what I'll call a case study or case studies on managing archives in the most difficult of situations. Archival Vista's briefings is inspired by the section's successful original series, Archival Landscape Seminars, which began in 2020. In each seminar, an international guest speaker introduces participants to the issues and advancements in their local context, describing the history, operating environment, and unique aspects of archival practice in their country. And Ellen, may I impose on you to tell us when our next Archival Landscape Seminar will be? Yes, and I will put it all into the chat a little bit later. All right. May, but um, I'm happy to announce that the Landscape Series, the next one is June 1st, 6 p.m. Eastern Time with Nicola Laurent in, on Australia. From and on the topic of Australia. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, I'd also like to ask Ellen if you would please introduce yourself as a steering committee leader. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, also, on behalf of the steering committee and the members who can't be with us today, I'm Ellen Engseth, and I'm the chair of the section at the moment. Thank you so much, Ellen. Now, without further delay, I am honored to introduce to you our first guest, Mr. Jacob Nadal. Mr. Nadal is the Director for Preservation at the Library of Congress. He manages the work of the Directorate's four divisions, those being Collections Management, Conservation, Preservation Services, and Research and Testing. He provides leadership for the library's stewardship of the national collections and support for interagency cultural heritage preservation efforts and the library's role as the IFLA PAC Center for North America. He assisted with the development and charter of the United States Cultural Heritage Coordinating Committee's Preservation Working Group and has worked in preservation efforts in the aftermath of natural disaster or armed conflict, including through service on the board of the US Committee of the Blue Shield. Welcome, Mr. Nadal and all of our audience members. Thank you, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, if I may, I'd like to begin with a, a land acknowledgement uh, on behalf of the Library of Congress, um, which sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Piscataway, the Choctaw, Kwanki, and Manahanok nations. Uh, we acknowledge the traditional owners and sovereign custodians of the land on which we live and work and extend our respects to their ancestors and all First Nations people and elders past, present, and future. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here um, uh, and to be able to talk to you about the work of the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield um, and closely related to that work that happens in the federal government, especially through the Cultural Heritage Coordinating Committee uh, to support uh, the, the way that um, uh, a number of federal agencies engage in especially armed conflict and national natural disaster overseas. So Karen, I really appreciate the invitation and it's a 
it, it, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be able to um, launch this series. Well, thank you again for helping us launch it and we'll launch right away into our first question um, or request, which is to tell us a little bit about yourself, your experience, your education, your expertise and so on. Sure, sure. So uh, like, like many of you, uh, I did not um, uh, think uh, that I was going to be a librarian um, until, uh, and, until I stumbled into it. Um, so my, my uh, background is actually in performing arts, uh, music, and uh, music composition. Um, and one thing and another that led me to some music scholarship, and I had to meet some librarians and do some interlibrary loan. And I thought, all those people have a job. I think I could do that job, and I bet it's got a better dental plan than um, <laughs> the other one I was Well, and, and if I can jump in and just say, <laughs> ILL is a drug of choice, if, if I may say so. I mean, it once you get into that world, it's yeah. very uh, sticky. Yeah, all, all in one go, I discovered librarians and I discovered archivists because I needed to get copies of a composer's personal papers for a, a project I was working on. So for two minutes, <laughs> um, you know, I, I did my graduate work at Indiana University, um, had the opportunity to work on an early, early digitization project that was sort of co-managed between the digital library project and the preservation um, department there. Um, and uh, one thing and another, after a couple of years, I, I saw a career in preservation was was open to me and um, uh, and, and went in that direction. Um, and Indiana was really, um, aside from the run of the mill sort of uh, natural disasters that all of us deal with in our careers where the, the weather brings some surprises, uh, Indiana um, has a, an incredible uh, folklore program, and, and uh, as part of that, I connected with a group called the Liberian Collections Project. Um, they had been collecting in West Africa, um, in, in Liberia for some time, and uh, in the aftermath of the civil wars in Liberia, um, they got some uh, intelligence that there were um, some important papers that, that might be salvageable and, and put together a project to go over. Uh, so I traveled with that project as, as their um, kind of preservationist on staff um, and had a, an incredible opportunity to work um, doing um, a very meaningful salvage, right, that uh, not only documented the sort of uh, help to recover some um, important um, government archives, but also some personal collections and, and cultural collections. Um, and, and I think from that point on, um, have been attuned to the need for um, support of, of archives, especially in the aftermath of conflict. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and in Liberia, I think one of the um, key experiences I had was realizing that um, although we had gone over for um, a, a former president's papers and the potential to salvage um, an important folklorist's work, what really mattered was getting marriage records and land deeds available again so that people could start to rebuild their lives. And, and all of a sudden, um, the most uh, prosaic of bureaucratic records were the, were the most essential things for helping a country uh, begin to resume normal business. So it's a um, a lesson I really took to heart. Um, after after Indiana, I worked um, at New York Public Library um, for, for a number of years, um, had a chance to uh, then work at UCLA, starting a preservation program um, and kind of formalizing preservation work in their libraries. Um, and then back to New York uh, for some time at Brooklyn Historical Society, and then, then a, a, an operation called RECAP, which is a consortium that supports um, New York Public Library, Princeton, Columbia, and Harvard. Um, and uh, then when the, when the phone calls and it's Library of Congress saying that they're uh, recruiting for a preservation director and, and would you be interested? Um, so it's, it's a phone call you take seriously. So yes. I've been here for uh, it'll be about six years uh, uh, this summer that I've been at the Library of Congress. Excellent. Um, so can you please discuss the Committee of the Blue Shield yeah. and its general mission and membership? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is uh, an international Blue Shield organization um, and it has uh, uh, regional and national chapters all around the world. And so the, the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield is one of those um, um, and, uh, and, and one of the, the older chapters. And it really, the work of uh, Blue Shield International grows out of uh, wartime concerns, uh, seeing that uh, especially sites, uh, archaeological sites, uh, important architectural sites and monuments were um, being damaged um, uh, during conflict um, and, and recognizing that uh, oftentimes attacks on cultural heritage are, are a deliberate strategy um, that, that, that is to sort of um, 
uh, obtain a, a moral victory if you can destroy the cultural heritage of a people and uh, ideologically displace them. Um, it, it has a, a powerful effect. Um, and, and so coming out of um, the world wars, uh, Blue Shield formed um, and, and a lot of its work initially was to mark and register uh, important sites and buildings um, uh, with a, a literal Blue Shield emblem. Um, the scope has grown in, in the decades since. Um, libraries and archives are an important part of, of the work that um, USCBS and other Blue Shield groups um, uh, are, are attentive to. Uh, and, and the scope of issues has um, grown also from uh, not just the sort of kinetic conflict um, uh, of, of wartime, but also looking at uh, an array of threats, uh, natural disaster certainly, um, but, but also trafficking as a, as a really important issue that, that both imperils cultural heritage and funds um, uh, uh, you know, war and terrorism. Uh, so today uh, we have people who work on both movable and immovable tangible heritage, who work on intangible heritage, museums, libraries, archives, monuments, heritage sites. Um, it, it's a, a pretty wide remit. Uh, and, and members in Blue Shield really work on building awareness, um, advocating, especially in the, um, for the implementation of the uh, 54 Hague Conventions, cultural protection protocols, um, uh, and, and then facilitating training for armed forces, government agencies, heritage organizations, and the general public. So there's a, I, I would say that the substance of what we do every year is around education, advocacy, awareness, um, and then providing practical training and guidance to, um, uh, 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 to, to care for care heritage. Um, and membership includes a lot of working cultural heritage professionals, people just like us, um, a, a number of scholars and faculty um, in law, archaeology, and, and other disciplines um, who work on sites that may be at risk and have kind of become attuned to those concerns. Um, and, and we are fortunate also to have some people who just care about this issue, um, just on a, on a personal level. Um, and, and that's uh, that's something I would commend in anyone. And I especially commend it when it's someone who is like a lawyer or an accountant and can help us do the business of running a nonprofit organization. So we're, we're, we're really grateful for, for people like that. Um, and uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, the, some things that we have done, um, uh, educational events, meetings, um, and, and presentations, uh, but also more practical things, um, uh, raising humanitarian aid and gathering supplies um, that, that can be delivered to librarians and archivists in, in conflict zones, providing simple moral and financial support. Um, and, and sometimes that can be very practical. Um, uh, just last Sunday, I got word from one of our board members that they completed uh, evacuation of a film archivist in Afghanistan who had been at, at high risk. And so they're uh, out of Afghanistan and, and en route, um, and they'll have a, a visiting faculty appointment at, at Bennington College um, so that they have a, a landing space. So, so sometimes it can be very practical and very personal. Wow. Yeah. But no less profound. I mean, that is that is quite a story in and of itself. Yeah, it's that that particular board member. Um, I my my hats off uh, to them. They um, have really recognized this um, the potential for getting people who have invaluable knowledge out of harm's way and and helping find placements for them to to work in the U.S. Um, until it's safe for them to return. And in the meantime, to make them available as someone who can provide guidance um, and, and practical information about what's happening, you know, in, in their country of origin. Absolutely. So in what context did you first learn about the Committee of the Blue Shield and how did you initially get involved? Yeah, I, I'm embarrassed to say I was trying to recall when I first encountered Blue Shield members. It, it happened pretty organically through mm. uh, other work I was doing. And, and I think um, uh, especially about 10 years ago, there was a lot of work um, organizing domestically under uh, a FEMA group, um, uh, organizing first responders for natural disaster and, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and encountered a couple of Blue Shield board members and, um, uh, and, and um, started to talk to and, and consult with them about, especially issues relative to libraries and archives, something that um, had come up and, and for, um, you know, I think the 
membership at that time, at least the board was much more strongly archaeological and, and museological. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, well, got an invitation to join the board. Um, I think I'm on to my third term now um, as, as, a, as a board member. Um, most of what I do with, with the board and ends up being to assist with um, reporting and planning. Um, uh, so the um, we, we are fortunate to have board members, especially um, who are university faculty and have um, are able to put a lot of time into um, education and outreach and, and a number of people who have specializations in art law um, mm -hmm. um, work on, on those issues. So, so I, I provide a little more bureaucratic support um, and also connections to the obviously the library and archives sector when, when there's some information or expertise needed, uh, but also connections to government. So um, Karen, you mentioned the US uh, Cultural Heritage Coordinating Committee, and that's, I think, an important body for um, IAS to know about. Uh, this was created uh, 2016, I believe. Uh, um, and uh, it was uh, derived from uh, some earlier legislation around trafficking of Syrian antiquities and, and things that the executive branch agency should do in response to that. Um, and, and, and subsequent to that, Congress um, uh, passed a sense of Congress uh, resolution that said, um, essentially Congress thinks the executive branch agencies should convene together um, everyone who has a stake in international cultural heritage issues. Um, State Department should convene this meeting and, and you should consult with um, Library of Congress. So I come over from Article One <laughs> as well as mm -hmm. part of that. Um, <laughs> but also that you should consult with NGOs and 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 uh, U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield is specifically named in that legislation. Um, so so we have a sort of uh, congressional direction for cultural heritage coordinating committee and U.S. CBS to um, to be in touch with each other. Uh, but but Congress was also clear in that that you know they recognize there are important NGOs that are involved in this as well, and they want government to to work with them. But but that group, the Cultural Heritage Coordinating Committee, um, has been convening for about five years now. Um, and it's an exceptional forum. It gets uh, the cultural agencies, Library of Congress, Smithsonian uh, archives um, at the table with State Department. So our diplomatic corps is there. Um, law enforcement, uh, both Customs and Border Patrol and internally FBI art crime. Um, and then military and military intelligence uh, so that we can, can really talk about um, how cultural heritage needs to be managed and, and thought about, provide training and direction. Um, we, uh, you know, uh, that, that's the group that prepares reports on uh, Hague, Hague Convention, um, cultural property protection implementation and all this. It's become a very active, um, active group. Uh, I think of, of sometimes interagencies are talking forums, but but this is a group mm -hmm. that really, really does get stuff done and, and, and for, uh, a group that's that new, the fact that we have working groups chartered that are doing doing actual work uh, really, I think really shows a, a commitment um, and, and passion on behalf of the, the participants that, that cultural heritage um, really matters to them. And I'm assuming Interpol uh, enters into the conversation. They do. Um, you know, there's a, there are some diplomatic nuances about how we how we correspond to them. But yeah, this is um, uh, one of the goals of, of an effort like this is to make sure that um, we don't have two agencies having slightly different conversations with a group mm -hmm. like um, and, and that we have a really unified policy. Um, and and it, this group has been I think really useful in terms of, uh, you know, in some ways offering training um, where we have oftentimes draw on Blue Shield members to say, gee, we need an expert in this field to give a couple hours to Customs and Border Patrol um, agents um, who, who are seeing thousands and thousands of items come through, but to, to give them, you know, a couple of key points to just say like, this, this would be normal and procedural but if you see something like this it should raise your suspicions um, and you should mm -hmm. and and to give them the reach back capabilities to say um, we we've detained something or we've we've uh, identified something and and quickly connect them to an expert who can help them through the next steps of determining if that's legitimate you know um uh import export versus versus trafficking mm -hmm. 
You mentioned term service. How long is a term service for a board member? Uh, board members serve on three-year terms, um, and uh, I, I I should be able to remember from the bylaws how many of those we can do. I think I <laughs> <laughs> on, on my last one, uh, but uh, it, yeah, uh, three-year terms. And I would say, you know, we have board members um, just depending on you know, kind of their personal and professional um, uh, lives. Some of whom are very active. You know, Blue Shield is a major component of what they do. Um, you know, and they're serving in in a board officer position as a president or similar. Uh, but there are a number of us who are really there to just provide advice and counsel at the board meetings to, you know, facilitate you know maybe connections with our profession and our community. And so um, it, it can be a lighter or heavier lift. Um, okay. Okay. And, and if that's something that that people are interested in, um, you know, I uh, please uh, share. Um, I'll, I'll give some personal contact information um, to Karen so that she can connect you to me. And um, yeah, both uh, membership, which is inexpensive, I think $50 for professionals uh, working in the field, um, uh, which, which provides access to the annual meetings and other you know, information and, and, and opportunities to, uh, for, for service and participation, um, or to service on the board where, where you get to sort of help shape direction. Um, and, and now is an interesting time for the um, for the commission, um, COVID was obviously a, a curveball for a group that's used to working on site-based uh, projects. Sure. Um, uh, we also had a, a real unfortunate uh, sudden death of our our past president, and so we've been sort of reconstructing the board last year and, and reinitiating the program. And so uh, those, those are, are are grim times to look back on. But um, I think there's a a, a really um, I, I think there's a lot of awareness for the need. Um, and, and we're seeing a lot of engagement from our members to um, uh, sort of figure out the next arc for Blue Shield. Mm -hmm. In this, I, I'll take it then you've been a board member for six years? Uh, I think that is correct. Yeah. Okay. I brought into my, my third term. My, my, my incredible math skills at yeah, work yeah. <laughs> and, and for the world to see. Um, so what would you say is uh, our previous um, arcs in the in the activity of the Blue yeah. Shield in the time you have served in yeah uh, I, I I would say the the major set of activities um when I first uh, got involved with Blue Shield um was really support of uh U.S. military in, in a couple key areas um uh, one of those was um sort of reconstituting the uh, monuments officers program um that's uh uh, for, for those of you who, who are, are military minded, um, there's civil and public affairs officers, KPOC, um, and it's the, the six victors, the six Vs. Um, so that program was, was being um, sort of re, re uh, you should be careful about the word commissioned, but um, re resumed and, and, and re reinstated. Uh, and a lot of uh, members were providing um, training and support uh, for that. Uh, there was also a lot of work and continues to be a lot of work on um, helping to guide um, the development of no strike lists. Um, and I think one mm. of the most important things that Blue Shield has done in, in partnership with other NGOs, uh, to, be, to be certain, um, is support monitoring of um, sites uh, that's very active in Ukraine right now, for example, to be analyzing satellite photography of, uh, of sites to determine you know, where, where um, uh, damage has occurred. Um, but also supplying our military with guidance about no strike zones and areas that require special protection. Um, uh, that's done with a GIS marker rather than a, uh, a little blue shield plaque um, mm -hmm. these days, uh, but, but is really important information. Um, uh, and, and then there's been a, a steady um, uh, sort of backbeat of advocacy and awareness. So uh, I obviously don't participate in, in lobbying and advocacy trips, but there have been a number of trips to the Hill by Blue Shield members to speak with um, uh, congressional members and staff, um, uh, regular kind of educational events and symposia on topics uh, uh, in, in cultural property protection. Um, and, and that work continues. I think as we look forward, you know, um, the ways that we can raise um, humanitarian aid uh, directly are important um, programs to identify key people who um, you know have on the ground expertise and and um, be in contact with them, facilitate evacuations uh, as we've done um, are important. And and now there's actually a really nice um, 
uh, line of work in terms of the ongoing support and training for military customs and border patrol and, and, and others. So we've had a number of Blue Shield members who have participated in like um, uh, essentially field events, you know, a simulated um, uh, uh, project to um, address a cultural heritage crisis um, as training for, you know, for the monuments officers. And th those events are really incredible to, mm -hmm. to see unfold. Um, and can you also speak to what, in your tenure with the Blue Shield, what stands out as super meaningful experiences for you directly? Um, you know, there there are two pieces of it. Um, one uh, is uh, hearing from people um, in country um, who who have been able to. Um, you know, use some of our capabilities or knowledge um, to to do really meaningful in situ protection of, of cultural heritage, um, and and that um, that contact and that that direct contact is uh, is just really galvanizing. Not mm -hmm. not only for the value of the work of Blue Shield, but just for the value of the work we do as as archivists and librarians. Um, uh, it, it really drives home um, the. What, what's fundamentally important about a, a profession that oftentimes, and for good reason, can get caught up in nuances of metadata standards, um, uh, but but to really be reminded of, of you know, this, the, why there's a fundamental need to do those metadata standards. And, right. Right. Absolutely. Uh, uh, so those, those real personal connections are meaningful, and I uh, I, I I look at some of the people I serve on the board with, and and just they are just professional inspirations to me. You know, in in terms of the um, lifelong, in many cases, commitment they have had to um, uh, supporting and and improving the way we we uh, care for cultural heritage. Uh, the, the, so I mean, it, it's a place where um, you you get to just meet and engage with a lot of really inspiring um, uh, inspiring people. Um, I, I think one of the most amazing things for me, you know, was, is, and, and continues to be, is just the chance also to work really directly with military and law enforcement, um, and, and to see how, um, thoughtful, um, and, and pragmatic, um, uh, people in, in those professions are and, and how, um, just what, what, um, collegial and helpful relationships there are and, um, you know, the, the sort of thing that uh, when I was going into library school, it never occurred to me that there were um, uh, cultural heritage careers uh, in, in, uh, in those branches of government and to see both that they are, but, but in some ways, even more importantly, that um, there are people in um, significant positions in, in those fields who are, are really open to and see the value in, um, in having a thoughtful approach to cultural heritage um, that has been, been really inspiring. I would think so. I, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to narrow it down <laughs> yeah, in terms yeah. of in terms of those uh, probable case studies. But yeah. um, so at what risk do committee members actually put their own lives? I mean, you've touched a little bit on this in some nuanced way, but yeah, in yeah. direct terms. Um, so so let me just the short answer to this is none at all. <laughs> so the, the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield um, uh, is not and and does not direct people to go travel into a conflict zone or a, or or a, a risk area. Um, the the other side of that is is no surprise if you hang out with Blue Shield um, members and board members, um, they will have some stories to tell, um, mm -hmm. and many of them, you know, in the course of their work, have um, been involved in. Um, have traveled to conflict zones and done post-conflict recovery have worked in natural disaster environments. I have myself, but, but that's um, not because there's an expectation or requirement that members, you know, promise to, to be ready to deploy. Um, and, and in fact, when we, uh, we brought on a research fellow a couple of years ago, and part of that agreement was a clear stipulation that we would not be <laughs> this person uh, into a war zone as part of the agreement. Um, uh, I, uh, so, uh, it, it's important to make that distinction that, mm -hmm. that although members by their professional roles or or inclinations um you know do uh, at times but that's a, a personal decision that they make about right. you know, their work it's not something that's required of, of members or or, um, or or that we direct um the the other thing i mentioned also right is that there is an active um 
uh, monuments officers program and, and and many of those people are reservists um and, and so of course the military may draw on them to um, travel to a conflict zone but that's again handled as as part of the the military's mission um our work really the the, the common work for for blue shield members is is around advocacy and awareness mm -hmm. and organization so working on policy providing training um uh, opportunities to support recovery projects, uh, gathering aid, whether that's money, supplies, or, or information. Um, and uh, and as I said, you know, I think particularly for IAS, um, that work of inventorying sites to protect um, is is so important and and an area where we're somewhat deficient is library and archives, right? I mean, it's um, uh, in, in some ways by nature of the work, archaeological sites have GIS coordinates uh, ready mm. to go. Uh, it's fairly easy to drop a pin on a museum um, or, or a, a temple. Um, but knowing that there's an archive um, or that uh, this particular building, you know, th this is not only a monastery, but has an important collection in it, um, that, that information is often, you know, just one degree further than um, uh, than, than, than we immediately have. And so participation of librarians and artists is, is I think, really important in, in helping us provide better support on, on those things. The other piece that, you know, I talk myself blue in the face uh, about, uh, given the chance, is the importance of um, uh, essentially the bureaucratic architecture of, you know, where are the government records kept, um, uh, you know, thinking about, you um, in the case of Ukraine, actually, we did a number of projects um, to look at whether we could get key sort of bureaucratic information digitally safe kept, um, mm -hmm. knowing that in the aftermath of conflict, again, land records, uh, property records, uh, marriage records, genealogical records would be very important for people in, in sort of reconstruction. And, and those are things, you know, the the Office of the Register of Deeds um, doesn't necessarily land on people's radar as an important piece of cultural heritage or a monument to local history and culture. Um, but boy, in terms of reconstructing civil society in the aftermath of a, of a conflict, all of those those government offices become you know really significant. I think the the lens that archivists have on that um, you know is really valuable. It's one where we where we need to build some strength. I think um, I'm almost embarrassed that this question almost did not occur to me, but I will ask you, um, where are the Committee of the Blue Shield archives? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I, I, I'm embarrassed. I don't have a really good answer to that either. Um, uh, they they are handed around from um, uh, you know, president to president. Um, oh, I see. Some of the things we've done in recent years, actually, is we... Um, uh, stood up uh, a, a new person to help as our sort of um, uh, uh, essentially to, to fill a sort of executive director role and, and help us manage our, our booking and bookkeeping so that we mm -hmm. keep a record of those. Um, but as with most places now, Google Docs is the short answer. <laughs> um, so. I hear you. <laughs> um, so when you mentioned uh, the need for expertise, obviously, what would you say is a current need uh, in terms of uh, expertise and experience that any of us could bring to the Blue Shield should we be interested? Yeah, well, I, I would say uh, just the archival perspective is, is valuable. And mm -hmm. People who are used to thinking about the types of records that are created and how those records are used um, uh, is is really invaluable for um, kind of helping to just do the due diligence of thinking about uh, a country that might be in conflict, uh, uh, an area that might have been affected by natural disaster, um, and, and helping to understand what may need to be salvaged, what types of information it's possible to look for and, and may be available um, if you ask the question in the right way. And so, you know, um, that that kind of just archivist perspective um, mm -hmm. it is really is, is really invaluable. Uh, the other thing that I, I would say um, uh, is that, you know, I, as I work with archivists, I'm often struck by, um, because so often archivists um, are integrated with the way organizations run and operate. Mm -hmm. uh, Blue Shield itself is an organization that needs to run and operate. Um, and, and so, 
I, I think there is just some sweat equity value that, that archivists can provide in helping us run that organization well um, and having connections to, to people with, with other pieces of expertise that, that an organization needs. You know, so I mentioned um, uh, you know, bookkeeping, law, fundraising and development. Um, and one of the things that we have been uh, conscious of, I think it's fair to say in the, the last arc is that we have had uh, a lot of really committed professionals, right, who have, you know, practical involvement in the field. Um, but being a, a top flight archaeologist um, doesn't necessarily make you a great fundraiser or, or membership uh, <laughs> coordinator, right? And, and I, I think that's, um, as we sort of post-COVID looked at how to rebuild and grow the organization, there's a, just a, a really substantial and meaningful amount of work to be done helping us get the word out and and build and manage our membership you know in, in an effective way and um, but the number of archivists i know who are effective at um, managing and um and, and and running things is a, is a pretty long list i think i think the the training lends itself to that um you mentioned fundraising how how is the blue shield funded uh it is primarily uh, member funded, so so we collect um, uh, dues from members. As I said, those are pretty mm -hmm. lightweight. Um, so individual members, we have a few institutional members um, uh, who who make a, a notable contribution, uh, and then occasionally we will get um, grants and aid from from various sources. Um, and, and so Blue Shield is is uh, I'm happy to say in a financially healthy position where uh, we're, we're, we're in the black, um, but we're not an organization with a lot of zeros <laughs> attached to it. And, <laughs> and, and that's right. one of the questions is, um, uh, you know, we're, we're capable as, as is of providing a few important educational opportunities, facilitating connections, um, and, um, uh, you know, being a source of information and advocacy, but that there's sort of the uh, the next zero of providing more substantial resources and being able to fund uh, more substantial projects and the zero after that that you mm -hmm. know uh and and in to what extent do we need to grow in that direction and, and at what pace and so I, I that makes it you know i think uh a, an exciting time in in the sense that there is a willingness and awareness of the need to start looking ahead to the future. Um, and also we're not doing that in, in the process of digging ourselves out of a hole, right? There, mm -hmm, there's mm -hmm. strong core board members, some longtime uh, members um, and, and a, a, a position to start from that, you know, doesn't, doesn't mean we're, we're dealing with, you know, uh, kind of a, a lot of, um, uh, you know, some, like plenty of you, I'm sure work for small scrappy nonprofits and um you know we're 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 not due for lease payments on our office space right now. <laughs> underwater um just wanted to to know your from your perspective what misconceptions might there be about the blue shield you know, and what it's, its mission is it, it's funny that i'm surprised how often people ask me about should you really be putting those blue shields on things <laughs> that make markets um <laughs> which is which is in some ways a fair enough question uh, but but yeah the degree to which blue shield has moved on from being a um a a a, a marker of sites with enamel pins um, though as a member, you get a handsome enamel pin to, to put on your lapel, um, uh, and has really become, uh, especially for U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield, um, uh, I, I think I think we're often one of the best things we do is just be uh, an important sort of broker or connector of uh, of expertise between um, groups that are confronting or dealing with the the practical facts of cultural property protection with the expertise and resources that that, that they may need um, mm -hmm. and, and and how much we are a, a really a, an education and advocacy and and, and policy organization uh, and, and and not just a, a kind of field work uh, right right yeah. um so how can others become involved? You mentioned membership and not a very high price tag on that. Yeah. Um, is there is there a link or anything? I know Ellen put a link into the yeah, about. It should, well, it should be easy to find on our on our recently refreshed website. Right. <laughs> Look at the top. There's a, a link to join. Okay. Uh, 
And uh, like, like any organization, um, it, it's, uh, we, we try to make sure it's, especially for working professionals in, in our field, but, but there's not a high price tag on it. Uh, we're mm -hmm. willing to accept any dollar you're interested in giving us, uh, you know, uh, of course. Um, the other things I would say, you know, um, uh, as a member, of course, uh, we, we host an annual meeting that um, often brings together some really compelling um, speakers and provides some um, so some really interesting information. Um, and, and, and then really as your interests, time and inclinations um, uh, direct you, there are opportunities to be, to be involved in a variety of projects and, and, uh, and calls for assistance on, on, on things that may be happening. And, and I would say, you know, my, my own orientation to this work after, um, you know, my, my trip to Liberia was to just start hanging out on listservs, going to some conferences, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and eventually getting, you know, I, I spent several years just getting sort of habituated to the existence of this part of the field and what it did. And I think, um, uh, you know, that that alone is, is I think, really healthy. It, it certainly changed my um, my sense of myself as a professional before I'd ever, you know, right. attended a meeting or sat on a board of directors. Um, yeah. um how would you describe the annual meeting? I mean, does it take place in the same place every year at the same time every year? Uh, roughly. Uh, so we, we normally meet in Washington, D.C. It's um, given the number of government uh, staff involved. Uh, it, it's a convenient destination. Smithsonian, especially through their cultural rescue initiative, has been a, a big player on on both the government and and, uh, and sort of as in their NGO role. Um, uh, and and so uh, we're often hosted uh, at a Smithsonian venue. Mm -hmm. One of the things that has been, I, I think, uh, uh, something we've all figured out is how to do something like this. Um, yes. And, and so um, the the site based meeting um, has really been supplemented by a lot of virtual participation options mm -hmm. as well um, in in recent years. And I I don't see any reason we would stop doing that. Um, it, it's great to be able to get people get together in person. It's um, nice to have a cocktail reception and and get to you know talk one on one about. Uh, about things, uh, but the, the the affordance of being able to bring people in remotely mm -hmm. to, to hear mm -hmm. presentations and participate in discussions, I think it's been really, really valuable. Absolutely. It wouldn't and happen would say, to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and I would say, you know, it's a, a large enough group to be meaningful and small enough that you get a chance to really talk one-on-one -on -one to, the, uh, to the, the people who were there. So, right. Yeah. And what time of year does this happen? Uh, in the spring, um, oh, okay. really lucky there are cherry blossoms, or or unlucky in terms of finding a hotel room. Um, yeah. But but yeah, usually we hold an annual meeting in the spring, um, and uh, and and are looking at you know uh, what kind of regular communications um, might go along with that, and whether there might be some more frequent, especially now that we're we're you know in in a, a pretty hybrid world, mm -hmm. whether there are opportunities to do more frequent training and outreach online. Um, do you ever try to um, be a part of the Society of American Archivists annual meeting in any way, or you know, is that I, something you would think about? Uh, I'm not aware that we have, mm -hmm. uh, but but certainly it, it, it's something that uh, I, I think we'd be open to. So to the extent that you know a, a, an interest group or working group wanted someone from USCBS to come and talk, um, I, I'm sure we would we would find people to, to, to be in that room um, and, and figuring out ways for us to, I think, regularly connect with SAA members and uh, so that they know about the, I think just the real kind of parallel mutual interests uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of those, those two and groups together yeah, would, would be wonderful. And, and I would be happy. I mean, I can put my hand in the air to say, um, uh, uh, you know, look, look me up. Uh, that's, that's sort of what I'm on the board to do is to uh, help facilitate those connections. Wonderful. And and what would you do? You know about the um, the international committee in terms of its uh, meetings and participation in, in like groups like uh, SAA. Yeah, I, I am less tuned into the Blue Shield International. Um, there there is an annual uh, meeting that's attended by various directors of various uh, chapters. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I'm I'm not as familiar with sort of the operation and, and organization at that level. Got it. Um, so what have I neglected to ask you 
in this particular forum before we open it up to others to ask. Um, you know, I think we, we, this has been really a nice chance to, to talk about this. And I, I would say uh, I'd, I'd be just delighted to open it up to the to the group and, and see what questions they might have. OK, so it's your opportunity, folks. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat just yet, but you're more than welcome to put those questions there. Um, like I said earlier, it'll be uh, first come, first answered situation uh, to the effect we have time. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce uh, Marina Palienko, uh, who is an archivist from Kyiv, and she will be our guest um, within the series, the third of three, uh, on June 16th. So welcome, uh, Marina. Um, I hope I hope this this forum has given you a sense of what to expect. <laughs> yes, thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, Mr. Nadal. It's very interesting uh, uh, topic, uh, and uh, um, you uh, told us uh, a lot of uh, very important information about the activity of Blue Shield and especially your activity in this organization. And may I ask you a question uh, what, about Ukraine, maybe, uh, this time. Um, in your opinion, um, uh, what national and international initiatives uh, uh, are the most important for Ukraine today, maybe for support um, uh, conservation problems of Ukrainian cultural heritage to help to protect and uh, care? in, the, in uh, our areas where the conflict, uh, uh, now war conflict uh, yeah. zones. I, I think one of the most important things um, that I've seen with, with Ukraine is uh, a real direct recognition of some of those activities as, as war crime, as, as, as deliberate assault on cultural identity and cultural heritage. Um, uh, there have been a few meetings of Cultural Heritage Coordinating Committee to get briefings from uh, embassy staff um, uh, about the state of state of things on the ground, and um, uh, there are public numbers of uh, hundreds of museums, libraries, archives, and thousands of sites um, deliberately targeted, um, and uh, that's a that's a very significant. Um, just in terms of um, sort of, uh, you know, our, our Hague Convention uh, uh, and, and international law, that's a very important matter, right? Um, that um, in, in terms of the type of conflict this is. Um, I think there have been, you know, some successful projects uh, um, to do monitoring of, of, of sites and, and progress of, of conflict. Um, so the um, I'll, uh, Karen, I can follow up with a link to the project um, uh, rather than try to rattle it off for everybody. Um, but um, uh, you know, Monuments Lab has been looking at what sites are being damaged and when. So we have a strong record of that. Um, uh, some of the work right now is just securing the evidentiary basis to document what happened um, so that there can be some, you know, some, some justice. Um, I think the other really interesting thing that I've I've seen with with Ukraine and and um, uh, you know let, let, let's hope it's soon that we are talking about um, reconstruction and, and 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 restoration, not not conflict, uh, but I think just a real awareness of the work that is necessary to rebuild the cultural sector in Ukraine and and to look at um, how uh, that country will will need to develop a cultural sector sector, um, how important that is for Ukrainian identity and morale, and how it will not simply be a matter of the Ministry of Culture doing it, right, that, that in the aftermath of this conflict, the government will have pressing concerns of, 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 um, uh, of public health and safety that it, it needs to attend to. And, and so there are some uh, discussions and meetings happening now to begin to rally uh, awareness from, from the U.S. cultural sector um, to, to be a, of support and in some ways to help
help model, you know, successful practices in our in our cultural sector, which is much more entrepreneurial and distributed rather than than sort of state run. And so I think I think that has been a, a really galvanizing thing for me to know that there's thought now happening about about how to do reconstruction. Thank you very much, and uh, we are very appreciate your uh, moral expert support and financial support of Americans. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us as always. And we have a hand up from our colleague Robert Pernica. Uh, thank you, Karen, and thank you uh, very much for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation, Jacob. I uh, was always wondering. Uh, what was the really uh, the role and the effect of your organization uh, in real life, for instance, uh, since I know I'm arriving from Croatia and uh, we have these uh, flags uh, put on the historical museums, uh, mm -hmm. put it, you know, in the uh, churches and actually it proved that they were uh, even better target, you know, for those yes. who would like to deliberately destroy that. So mm -hmm. I, I see somehow uh, that there is, uh, we have a problem with this. Uh, and uh, and I don't know how could you address, and if you allow me, I just would raise my second question. Like, uh, how do you prioritize? Uh, do you uh, react to uh, work uh, preemptive that something not happen or a uh, you know, something horrible happened. And then after that, you know, you said, okay, let's do what we can save because this is also, so basically how these decisions are made and who prioritize and yeah. when, I mean, sometimes you, you can predict some things, but sometimes some things really happen, you know, you have some yeah. earthquake or you have some yeah. like that. Well, so well the, the, you, you said that the answer to your second question is just yes, um, you know, all, all of that. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I think one of the things that is important, um, and, and I can sort of try to speak out both sides of my mouth, like a like a good director and bureaucrat, um, with the establishment of the Cultural Heritage Coordinating Committee, the, the government has a, a venue that it uses um, to coordinate those activities. Um, Blue Shield is, you know, in, in consultation, um, uh, also then receiving requests, um, sometimes through personal or professional contact, um, sometimes just by reading the headlines like we all do. Um, and, and so that um, with Cultural Heritage Coordinating Committee being established but relatively new and Blue Shield restructuring, now is a time where we're really figuring out what is the most expedient like way to do this that least overhead gets the, the gets solutions started quickly. Um, but yeah, there there is both a reactive and a proactive aspect to the work um, that that we're doing. So there are certainly areas where we um, know things are unstable, where we anticipate that conflict or may may break out, where we believe that trafficking and looting is a significant factor in you know, especially in funding terrorist organizations. Uh, so we can proactively work on education around how to identify antiquities from that region. Um, developing no strike lists if we think um, you know uh, conflict is is a possibility reactively of course you know when when we see um, you know a fertilizer explosion in um, in, in the port in in you know in, in Beirut um, uh, we we you know help to kind of um, support response and, and advice about those things um, uh, remind me the first part of your question though was, was really more about sort of like uh, how effective it is, and how, I mean, yeah. you have this, uh, right. you know, flags yeah, and stuff I, I, like that, right? Right. And think, then they prove to be actually even better yeah. targets, you know, for those who uh, want to. Yeah, I, I think the transition to GIS based, based no strike list is really important here, right? It lets us identify those places without um, directly flagging them. That said, and I, I. But let me say I am not a, a cultural property law expert um, uh, and, and, and share, Robert, your concern. This is a, a really delicate issue um, to prosecute a wartime crime. Um, there, uh, I think, is sometimes a need to show intent. Right. Um, and 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 when I talk to people who work <laughs> on those legal matters, um, I hear both sides of this, you know, that that uh, a site that is marked and identified 
uh, makes a stronger case, right? Like there, if this was targeted, it had to have been deliberate, right? It can't just have been, you know, accident or collateral. And also we don't want to make, we don't want to invite the targeting of those things knowing that there are bad actors. And I think, um, I, I wish I had a way to resolve or mm -hmm. answer that question. Um, uh, I, I don't, I, I see both sides of it as, as being significant. Um, and, and it's one that, you know, I, I think across different Blue Shield national chapters, you would find different um, different takes on it. And even among different Blue Shield members, uh, mm. different takes on it. But yeah, it's a, it's a recognized issue that that mm. we need to balance um, uh, the, the protective value that awareness gives to something with the targeting value. It's the, in some ways, it's the same question we ask when we publish our library catalogs and our finding aids, right? Um, mm. uh, uh, it's much easier than to know what we have, and it's much easier than to know what we have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a great analogy. Um, right. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we also have a question in the chat, and it'll be our last for this session. Um, and it comes from, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, Kara Kuhn. And uh, they ask, what additional training would you recommend for an archivist or oral historian to find a role in helping preserve endangered archives? Um, what a great question. Mm. Uh, I, I will say again, like, uh, the benefits of getting in touch with the organization, just being on, on listservs and monitoring conferences are is really valuable. Uh, I, I would say that the, the avenues into this, um, one is just to recognize that there is a field of art law and cultural property law. Um, Lawyers Committee for the Protection of Cultural Property um, has an annual meeting and, and looking them up will, will give you an orientation. Uh, Blue Shield, of course, um, but, but some education around um, international cultural property law. And you could start even just by looking up the 54 Hague Convention and, and the, um, the protocols that apply to cultural heritage, I think are eye-opening in terms of um, you know, uh, how, how these, these um, factors are, are managed. Um, for, for a nice evening in, um, Monuments Men <laughs> it was, a, it was a watchable movie, um, and uh, you know it's fictionalized, but it uh, you know tells an important part of that story. Mm. Uh, I think the other thing to be aware of is just um, uh, all of the things that apply to large-scale international post-conflict salvage and all this apply at the local scale to your personal you know place of work, right and. What does it mean to have a good disaster plan? How do you go mm -hmm. about thinking through that? And, and, and so everything SAA does in terms of disaster preparedness and disaster planning, I think is really relevant. It's really pertinent to, um, to this, to how the, those factors play out. And so I, I, would, I would in some ways commend you to your own organization um, that in the, the preservation section, uh, I, I know there are people who are, are great for disaster planning. Um, and, and that this has been a, a theme in SAA um, uh, because a, a lot of what we're doing, you know, at, at, at this kind of national and international level is, is thinking through uh, different factors, right? Uh, but these same issues of what does it take to protect and restore normal operations uh, of the cultural sector. But, but yeah, the, I, I, would, I would say also, you know, just to poke around about art law and um, cultural property law and through the Hague Convention is a great starting point. And with that, we are at 10.59. That, that is like music to my ears in terms of um, militaristic timekeeping. <laughs> so <laughs> Jake, it has been a total pleasure and a wonderful experience. And Sarah, if you will contact me, I will pass on your question, which is coming at the last minute. Ellen, did you have any closing remarks? Just a sincere thank you. This was fascinating. And um, thanks to all who join us today. A Absolutely. real pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And Karen, I'll, I'll be happy to follow up with, uh, with you on other information. Terrific. Uh, Jennifer, same to you. Any questions, send them my way and I will pass them around liberally. Thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Stopping recording. <laughs>